Hello and welcome to yet another episode in CSC 280, Introduction to Cybersecurity. The topic today will be access control. Back in the beginning of the series, we talked about the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And what we said was, it all comes down to authorization, because a breach of confidentiality is a disclosure of information to an entity who was not authorized to know what was the information about. Just like a breach of integrity means that there was unauthorized modification of data or of systems. And so the key question then becomes, what does authorization mean? How do I authorize someone? Well, we look back and we say, okay, before I can authorize someone, I got to figure out who they are. And that is what authentication was all about. So on authentication, establish a belief of identity. We use cryptographic tools um, to do that. We talked about those in the previous topic. So today we'll talk about access control and we'll try to figure out that now that we know who someone is, um, what they should and should not be able to do. So access control is all about the prevention of unauthorized access to a resource. Um, or maybe flipping it around and saying is about the assurance that only authorized access happens with a resource. And that means that it's not just the access that is being regulated, but it's also um, regulating how a resource is used. So what we're trying to make sure is that only authorized persons can perform authorized operations, both of those. Authorization, then, is the opposite of access control. Access control enforces authorizations. Authorization is all about establishing privilege or establishing the rights to use a resource in a particular way. For an access control system to be effective, it needs to meet a whole range of requirements. For example, we must be able to rely on source data. We must be able to support very fine uh, specifications, but also very coarse specifications. For example, what I mean by that is, I want to be able to say that um, all Delphi campus members are allowed to park in the underground garage. You know, that's very broad, everyone. Just as long as you're associated with our campus somehow, you have a card and that card will get you into the garage. But I might also want to say, well, only me, Professor Lerner, can post grades for this particular section of CSC 280. That's very narrowly defined. And we need to be able to do both. And using the same system, we should be able to specify both of those restrictions. We want to do everything based on the principle of least privilege. And we've talked about that before. But what we mean by least privilege is that unless you're given the rights, you don't have them. So the default deny policy. And secondly, you're only given those rights, those privileges that you need to do your job and nothing more. Least privilege is an important one. Um, second is a separation of privilege or separation of duty. We want to be able to specify constraints in a way that say, okay, this person can use that system to you know, log accounts receivable, but they cannot also purchase things at the same time, just to make sure there's no conflict of interest there. We want to be able to support open and closed policies. An open policy is a policy that says, well, unless something is forbidden, it's allowed. And a closed policy is the opposite. It says, unless something is allowed, it is forbidden. From a security perspective, we typically prefer closed policies, but those are not always practical. Think, for example, if you're on campus on the wireless network and you want to use your computer to browse the internet, you're allowed to go anywhere, except maybe for a handful of sites that we know are hosting malware. And so that is called an open policy. Um, unless we do say no, you can go there. On the other hand, if you're trying to access the class registration system, we have limited access to only a handful of computers um, on campus that are allowed to go there, and so that's a closed policy. We want to be able to combine policies where I might be able to stack them. Uh, first of all, this policy applies to the general population, and then this uh, uh, policy applies to students, and this policy applies to employees. You know, I can stack them. That's called a policy combination. But there might be conflicts there. 
because someone could be a student and an employee. And how does that work? You know, how do we resolve um, a con potential conflict in policies? An access control system must take care of that as well. We want to make sure that we support the technical access control system with administrative policies. We don't just want to rely on technology. We also want to make sure that there's rules and regulations in place that guide our actions. And we want to have a concept of dual control, um, which is similar to the separation of duty, where we have to collaborate in order to be able to do something. A change of grade is one of those things, for example. I cannot, as a professor, do a change of grade by myself. I have to collaborate with the department chair and the dean in order to get that done. All three of us need to pr approve, and unless all three of us approve a change of grade, the grade is not being changed. And of course, that is a measure to control fraud um, or other kinds of academic dishonesty. So let's start talking a little bit more detail about access controls then. Establish some basic terminology. Um, we have subjects, we have objects, and we have privileges. The subject is the person who receives the authorization. The object is the, the thing or the person to which access is restricted. And then the privilege is the form of access that is being granted. So in other words, a privilege describes the way in which a subject may access a resource or an object. Um, so for example, if I am going to delegate access to my inbox, um, my inbox is the object. The delegation is the privilege and the subject is the person who was given the right to look at my inbox. Um, keep in mind, these are roles that people play. So I could be an object and a subject at the same time, depending on the context. So for example, I may grant someone access to my inbox, but I might also be granted access to someone else's in inbox, for example. And at that point, I would be the subject and the object, um, in, but depending on the context in which we use it. But it's always important to keep in mind, are you receiving the privilege or are you granting the privilege? There's a couple of things we need to have in place before we can do access control. I mentioned the first one already, that's authentication. I have to know who you are. If I don't know who you are, I cannot say you can do certain things. I might make them publicly accessible, so not limited to a particular individual, but to a grouping as a whole, public, um, but I need to know who you are before I can assign you specific privileges and before the access control system can enforce them. We have to have the authorization in place. Access controls are useless unless the authorizations are in there. Um, otherwise, it is a default deny and no exceptions at all. Um, and there has to be an audit trail. I have to be able to check that my access control system is working correctly. And that means I need to be able to look at a paper trail left behind for every single access control decision. Who was requesting access? To what resource? Was the exit granted? When was the access granted? What IP address was the access granted from? How long was the access valid for? And that is a lot of data, but we want to be able to keep that on record so we can go back after the fact and make sure that our system is working correctly or to have an external reviewer, an independent auditor review and make sure that what we have done is not only correct but also appropriate. Again, uh, let's look review quickly some of those principles that we talked about when we uh, covered our section on um, secure design principles. We talked about least privilege, I already mentioned that. It means that you should not have any more privileges than those that you need to get your job accomplished. Nothing more, nothing less. The problem with that is that privileges accumulate. People are granted more privileges as they go along because they realize they cannot do that job for whatever particular reason. And as a result, they are requesting additional privileges assigned to them. And that's fine. If that's appropriate, they should have those privileges. But if your job responsibilities change and people don't use those privileges anymore, very rarely does someone go like, oh, I used to be able to do this, but I don't need to do that anymore. Take that away from me, please. You know, and that it means privilege scope, uh, creep, sorry, a uh, creep scope. And that means that as people are with organizations longer, they might accumulate privileges without necessarily having the rights to them. The other thing that often happens is that a new employee comes on board. And when IT asks, well, what do they need to have? The answer is, well, just give them the same as that guy over there. 
Yeah, but that guy over there, that primary job might be the same one, but that guy over there might be serving on some other committee, and now all of a sudden our new employee has that as well. So we have to be very careful with that. And we have to make sure that if we design the overall process of granting access control, we also have to think about how we are going to revoke access controls when they are no longer appropriate. The separation of duties is meant for critical transactions. Um, so for example, in our world, we don't want to see a situation in which a developer can also push changes into production or a system administrator can um, influence the behavior of a system and the whole reason for that is, is fraud sensitivity. Um, if I am a developer, I can code in fraudulent lines, I can code in backdoors into my software and push it out into production myself because there wouldn't be anyone in between. And so what we want to establish is a, at bare minimum a policy, but hopefully also some technical controls that says, if you committed to this source code branch, you cannot push it into production. Someone else will have to review your work first to make sure it's appropriate and correct. And then that other person can push uh, stuff live. Of course, the whole um, idea is that, that people would have to collaborate in order to cheat. That's still possible, but the chances are less lower, much lower. Same thing like a police officer, you know, they arrest, but they don't judge. The judge judges, but the judge does not arrest. Again, a separation of powers. Access controls come in many different forms. We have, um, like we talked about controls in general, the access controls could be physical controls, things that we can see and touch. And whether those are doors and locks, cameras, lights, gates, guards, uh, guard dogs, or whatever it may be, landscape design, all of those are things that guide access to a physical resource. And so we can use that to our benefit. Um, what we also use, and that's probably more um, in the field that we are interested in, are the technical access controls, computer-based controls, software um, that enforces privileges um, through access control mechanisms. So for example, the fact that you as a student cannot grade yourself, um, the fact that you can only see the courses in Moodle that you are actually enrolled in. All of those are access control decisions that are made in software and as a result they are technical access controls. So for that to be successful and effective, an access control system must mediate all access. Um, in other words, you shouldn't be able to go around an access control system. The access control system should be the only way to access a resource. Similar to the firewall that we saw a while ago, it has to be a single point of control, and that means you also have a single point of audit. That principle is called full mediation. We want uh, our access control system to be not bypassable, and as a result, it provides full mediation of access to the resources, and that means that access controls can be enforced on all operations. Now, how do we specify those access controls? Well, there's many different ways of doing that, but the three main uh, approaches are through discretionary access control, mandatory access control, and role-based access control. Each one of those has variations, and each one of those can be used together as well. Um, and as we um, start exploring each one of these three in future videos, we'll figure out what the benefits and drawbacks of each mechanism are. You have seen each three of those, even though you might not know that yet. How we're going to implement those access control models, that's something for later uh, concern. For now, let's first figure out in the upcoming videos what those access control models mean, what their benefits, and what their drawbacks are. This is it for now.